Yeah, I was just thinking of two words today of just uh, gratitude and connection and just here at Green Cover, myself speaking on behalf of Green Cover, just very grateful for the connections we do have with John, but even the the people watching this webinar. So um, just wanted to say thank you for joining and thank you, John, for joining us. Um, John, uh, a lot of Johns on this webinar series. We had John Kimp on the first week, Jonathan being our kind of our host, and then John Hearman today. So don't get confused with all the Johns and Jonathans, but um, John Hearman, thanks for being here today. He He's a, a farmer, a grower, does a lot, um, a lot of things in eastern Colorado, a pretty dry environment, um, a lot of fallow ground kind of around you, um, I assume, kind of that, that kind of environment with lower rainfall. Um, but you, John, kind of get into your journey a little bit, just sounds like you've taken a, a different approach in, in how you've done things um, over the years with your farming experience, um, taking a systems approach and that type of thing. And um speaking of that systems approach you've, you've done a lot of growing seed for us at green cover um and you said you get into a little bit of cleaning seed actually too and kind of what opportunities that creates for you so um yeah john hearman everybody from eastern colorado take it away john thank you um yeah i'm from haxton colorado i'm uh, 35 years old i uh, farm used to farm with my dad. I grew up farming and in our area there's a lot of uh, wheat and summer fallow and that's how I grew up. A lot of tillage work and just growing wheat every other year on the same acre and I mean some corn came in the area and some millet as I got older into my teens and stuff so people started doing some rotations but it seemed like there was always that uh period of fallow still in there to get back to winter wheat planted in September. And I think it was, I came back to farm full-time in uh, 2012, and I believe it was uh, 2013 or 2014. I went to a no-till on the Plains conference when it was in Salina there. Um, and I actually heard Scott Ravencamp speak, and he, at that time he lived by uh, Hugo, Colorado, which wasn't too far from me and was actually in a worse environment than I was in Colorado, less rainfall, our average is 17. Um, but he was talking about all the different things he was growing and no-till and soil health. And, you know, at that conference, one thing kind of led to another. And I was like, holy cow, you know, it kind of opened my eyes to, you know, there's a whole different world out there of, you know, people, different people need different things grown and you don't, you know, there's more of the world than just wheat and fallow. Um, and I would say the thing at that conference that really like changed my journey in life was the uh, NRCS uh, rainfall simulator, believe it or not. Those pans that they had, they had five different uh, management practices laid out and they put water on those pans. And um, I seen the, you know, they had native soil with good cover and they had no-till and summer fallow and no-till they had no-till with good cover and they had no-till with no cover and they had tillage with no cover and you know i i couldn't believe how much water ran off on the no-till with no cover so you know right there the phrase was twin no no till no cover still no good i was like holy holy cow you know in an area where we might get a one and a half inch rainfall and you know, one minute, two minutes or whatever it is, you know, it's a dumper, big thunderstorms rolling through. If I realized if we hadn't prepared our soils to accept that rainfall event, then, you know, even though the computer, the math says you're getting this much rainfall a year, you're actually might only be utilizing 50, 60% of that if you haven't prepared your soil to accept that rainfall. And I feel like, especially in our area where, rainfall is a big limiting factor, then that kind of changed my viewpoint and really the trajectory of my my life, I would say. Um, so ap after that event, you know, I started getting into learning everything I could about cover crops and keeping my soil covered and what I could do on, on my farm to change the, the composition and change the health of my soil. And, you know, it kind of just led down a rabbit hole, I'd say, of trying to learn everything I could and one thing led to another and, and all these different things. So um, I've used cover crops on my farm since 2014, um, 
almost religiously every year. Um, I historically put them behind a summer harvest. So like um, I grow some cereals like wheat or rye or even oats or uh, peas, which are combined in the July time period out here. So for me, that's a good opportunity to go right behind the combine and I, I plant a diverse mixture of cover crops and my my journey is a little bit different i didn't start with like five acres or ten acres there um i feel like i educated myself and got into a group of people that were like-minded and i just said you know I, this is what i need to do and here's how i need to do it so i pretty much just did my whole farm right from the get-go and i still continue to do that to this day and i had took some uh, a lot of Haney tests in 2014 and some different soils some PLFAs when I first started. And I've kind of kept track of those over these years. And, you know, each year is a little different. One year you might be down or whatever. But as far as trend line, you know, over these last 10 years, it's been um, real interesting to see what I've done for my soil and just um, – like, for example, last year I, I had a new uh, team member that I was teaching to uh, run the drill and everything. And he was, you know, asking some questions. Why are we doing it like this? Why are we doing, why do you do things like this? And we were talking about the field next to us. So I I didn't have a shovel in the tractor. I just had my pocket knife. But my soil was mellow enough and wet enough and just great structure that, you know, we dug up a chunk with my pocket knife and I pulled up a rye root ball, I believe. And. You know, we looked at that soil and smelled it, and then we went a, we went 20 feet over to the other field that was some summer followed wheat that had wheat growing in it. And you know, just even your your feet can feel that as soon as you cross that line. You're like, holy cow! You know, is this concrete or what are we walking on? And you know, and I tried to get my knife in there and could barely pull anything up, and it's just powder and no structure and nothing to it. And then you know, the guy's like, oh, and I was. You know, my thing was like, what, you know, if, if you were had a garden or you're growing your food for your family, you know, where, where are you going to put your garden? Are you going to put on this side of the fence or that side of the fence? So he's like, oh, OK. So then, I, you know, kind of after that, he and those moments are good for me, too, because, you know, I'm so used to looking at my soil and how I've done things. And it's it's nice to go back and look at that and see where I was, you know, 10 years ago and. You know, I was I was in the same position, and so it's 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 good for me to have that too to be able to look at my soil and see what what things I've done for that. And you know, I would say that's my biggest benchmark or my indication of my soil health. Yeah, there's tests, there's this, there's that, but I would say the biggest thing for me is just taking a shovel out there and looking at my soil or you know, driving by a field after you got a real big thunderstorm and I know there's no lagoons out there. There's no water standing in my field. Mm. You know, I got everything that came out of the sky. I got put back into the ground and, you know, so, sometimes when it starts pouring, I hop in my car to go, go out and see just, I got some fields real near to my house. So I like to go out and, you know, just see if I got lakes or forming, but I, I know that's, not happening anymore there might be a rare occasion i get a little bit but you know i i always when i used to talk it's not about how much rainfall you get it's how much your soil can hold so you know that's been a big part of my journey and it has allowed me to use you know that journey wouldn't have happened or the stuff wouldn't have happened to my soil without um, using those cover crops over the years and you know pretty much having something growing on my field as many days as possible so you know i went from, i went from a 16 month fallow period to now i'm you know i'm I'm in the month or 45 day area usually in the springtime between terminating what's left over from growing last year and and planting a new crop and that you know that just changes to based on the year if it's dry and stuff i might have a little longer window to have things not growing to try and recoup recoup some moisture mm -hmm. and you know a lot along those lines you know when we we're i was just growing weed or millet and stuff you could only take to the elevator you know i met these 
people selling cover crop seed and you know you have to i think i talked with keith first and so i you know where are you guys getting all these seeds you'd have all these things for sale you know yeah we need something grown we need this grown or that grown and i was like oh wow there's all these things different things you can grow and actually you know have a rotation and it's fun trying something different and seeing different plants growing so that's kind of where i first got into growing stuff for uh, green cover and i'd say i think rye was the first thing i started growing for you guys and you know in our area rye's frowned upon because people been pulling feral rye out of their wheat for you know 50 years and then you, you go plant a field of rye and people are in a big tizzy but um i i started rye in 14 and i've grown it every year since then and i've kind of diminished my wheat acres and grown grown more rye and especially with my own cleaner it's allowed me to clean my rye and you know sell that directly to you guys already cleaned and, and ready to go but um just out here rye is a better fit um in this environment i feel like it's i've never sprayed my rye with a herbicide in the spring for weeds it just has an aleopathic effect i don't have to spend the 15 to 25 dollars an acre in herbicide uh you know post emergence in the spring that i have to usually do on my wheat and you know the residue especially running my my shellborn the residue that i can keep after that rye is really advantageous out here to catching snow and wind erosion and you know that residue sets you up for the next year if you know if it's a dry year or something i can keep my soil covered and you know, I, I don't really have a set rotation on the crops that i grow i kind of base it off the field conditions and what's happening but like if i have a field with low residue concern or i'm you know i can start to see the soil you know i'm i'm getting rye or a high carbon crop on there and i'm trying something to get that that soil covered up so that i can not only get a something above ground to catch snow, but something covered over the soil so that it, it comes uh, springtime or the warm months of the year. You know, I got that rye residue down there to cover that soil. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed with using the cover crops, especially like behind rye, um, beforehand, like when I harvest wheat and I would leave that fallow after a July harvest, come back springtime or may or june if you're drilling or planting something into there that stubble would you know be very challenging to plant into the roots would be breaking off it would ball up it would want to move with your drill or your planter you know it was a very challenging conditions it was like the soil was you know hungry and it's eating the roots and eating below ground stuff but once i started adding the cover crop mixes in there you know, comes come springtime, it's like the, the stubble's different. I fed the soil with that cover crop and that stubble will, it stays attached and it's still kind of springy like it is after you, after you harvest it. So it doesn't, you know, run my drill through there. It doesn't, it knocks down the residue a little bit, but it at least still stay attached to the soil. And, you know, that's really helpful out here because i've i've seen pictures of people like losing entire fields of uh stripper stubble of wheat and you know that just makes me sick to my stomach thinking about losing all that residue so you know one of my main goals out here is you know residue keep keep something on the soil as best as i can and that's how i you know makes a lot of my management decisions is is based on that residue mm. And I guess one of the um, one of the th things that I've discovered over these last few years too is, especially with my seed cleaner, is I've tried to save as many of my own seeds as possible that are grown on my farm because um, I like planting back my own seed that's kind of been acclimated to my soils and my uh, farming methods. And with the cleaner, that's you know allowed to do me allow me to do that i can save some of that seed back and i i really feel like it it does a better job on my farm as i've switched uh management practices you know my seeds aren't tailored to high 
um, synthetic fertilizer and uh, exorbitant amounts of herbicide. So, you know, if I can save those seeds. And um, I think Jonathan has some uh, slides of that rye that I sent him this morning. Um, this was three years ago, I believe. Um, I grew some Elbon rye. And I was short of my own seed about 40 acres on a 320 acre field. Um, and that, I guess there's my family, my two daughters and my son and my wife. And I, I, uh, try to run anything or part of the crops I grow are things I can run with the shell born. That's kind of a thing I keep in mind so I can try and keep as much residue, but Jonathan, do you have those, uh, three slides of the rye from this morning? Okay. So that these are, this is a side-by-side -side photo of an end row, um, like I said before, I was 40 acres short of seed on this 320 acres. So uh, Green Cover sent me some foundation seed, I believe, of Elbon that came from Oklahoma. And this, the rye that's closest to you in the photo that's further behind and is not headed out yet is my own saved seed. And the rye to your left in the photo that's almost six, eight inches taller and is already headed out is seed that came from um, Oklahoma. And my, you know, there's not, I don't have anything scientific. These are just observations, but um, I've, I've seen this before from my own seeds. And in our area, sometimes we'll get a, a frost or a freezing event come middle of May or something when that rye is headed out. And if that rye is headed out during that period, you know, it's not good for yields or the grain that's in that crop. So, you know, my observation of this is my seeds actually like genetically change themselves to, Hey, you know, we can't grow this fast out here. We're not, we're not going to be able to reproduce because we're going to get, you know, froze off by mother nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, and there's a, if you go to the next one, Jonathan, and the, those seeds were planted the exact same day and just, and wh where my seed, where my drill ran out of my own seed and, started planting that foundation seed. I mean, you could see it to the row, which rows ran out of seed. It was just night and day difference. So it, and here's a little, uh, you know, a bit further along and there was, you know, you, and it was even a different color um, once it started getting towards uh, harvest as it started turning yellow. So, you know, that fall time, they looked identical, but come springtime, you know, once they started greening up and, you know, three weeks in, I'm like, whoa, what, you know, what's that out there? And they, it was just always ahead of my safe seed. And um, once we got to the harvest stage, you know, the height was exactly the same. The heads were looked exactly the same. It, you couldn't really tell once you got to harvest time, but every time during that vegetative period, uh, that other seed there is just always a difference so you know that's kind of the that's why i've kept on saving my own seed and and trying to use as much of my own seed as is available on my farm and you know growing new things that doesn't always work sometimes you got to start over you know some sometimes you guys want uh, some seed that's closer to foundation but you know even saving it back one year or something and, and trying to do that it's been real interesting to see that progression and what happens i think there's one more jonathan we'll go to the next one so yeah that you know there's just another photo showing that different the same variety that was foundation you know already headed out and in, in quite a bit taller and you can see ex exactly where my drill went and where that seed ended so it that you know that's kind of eye-opening i don't know if you have you guys noticed that with any of your seeds or heard of that concept from anybody else? Yeah, I think that's oftentimes shared a little bit and just the, uh, yeah, lots of benefits of saving your own seed and having, you know, that locally grown kind of in your own fields and stuff. I mean, the epigenetics and stuff like that and just the region, regionality of it. So, um, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And then, John, kind of backing up a little bit, we were talking about just the drier rainfall and the residue and stuff like that. 
and I'm sure you get this comment a lot. We do in, you know, Western Nebraska, Western Kansas, Eastern Colorado, you know, if I plant cover crops, you know, won't that take up too much moisture, you know, that type of question. And you mentioned that a little bit, but if you want to go into a little bit of like how you would kind of answer those questions of, you know, water retention versus water usage. And I mean, there is a balance to be found there if you don't want, you know, certain biomass and residue kind of management there, I guess. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a common concern or, you know, it's a common comment out here that, you know, we don't get enough rain. You, you can't grow the cover crops because they're using too much moisture. Um, but if you just, you know, look at the fallow efficiency percentage, it's like 35% or something. I haven't looked at it for like 10 years, um, but um, it used to be like 35%. So you get 10 inches during the year. Um you know, you still got three and a half inches in your soil. Well, that's cool. What'd you do with the other six and a half? You know, so my opinion is you can use that other six and a half inches to grow something and lose it via photosynthesis and have root exudates and something going into your soil to benefit your soil. And, you know, in the long run, put money in your pocketbook or you can lose that uh, evaporation. So my thought process is, you know, you're going to, it's use it or lose it. So, you know, I've been under the impression that I might as well use it and grow these things and do things for my soil because, you know, the evaporation is going to take most of it away anyway. And so, yes, there is a, you know, there's a delicate balance come springtime out here. I, I feel like we get in my experience, you know, especially in the summer months, if you plant a cover crop, it's, you know, it's usually pretty dry. You might get a rain here or a rain there. Mm -hmm. um, but usually comes springtime, you know, you can, re with the spring rains or the spring snow, you can usually re replenish anything growing. But yes, there, in that time period, there always is a, a delicate balance. You know, out here, if you let a if you're trying for biomass and you want that cover crop to grow big and giant, like all the photos you see from back east, you're going to use up a lot of moisture to that and it's going to hurt your sub, sub, subsequent crop. So, you know, I try and out here, I try and terminate that, you know, in March or April to stop water consumption if I know I'm going to a another crop. And, you know, it, it depends on the... The year too, if it's drier, you know, I'll try and get out there earlier and, and get that eliminated to, you know, stop, stop my transpiration and start conserving as much as I can before the new crop needs to get in there. Um, yeah. but like, um, I think three years ago when we were super dry, I let my cover crops go too long. It was probably late April before I got those terminated and I went in there uh, mid-May or late May to drill some uh, millet and by at that time by letting them go too long I had had used up too much moisture at that stage and I had as a result of that decision I had a, a poor stand um, very little emergence I just didn't have the moisture in there and we did not get a rain you know I needed one rain to get that crop up and we never got that whereas people who didn't use cover crops, they had enough moisture there that they got their crops up. And, you know, I was, I was trying to get residue and I was trying to get my soil covered for the warm months, for the dry months. And it, at that year, it didn't work out, but that particular year, you know, come the end of things where it was so dry, you know, nobody hardly, even those guys that got their crop up, they didn't harvest anything as well because of, you know, they didn't get those rains either. So, um, you know, I felt like in that situation, yes, it sucked. But, um, you know, what what I was doing, I was preparing myself for the summer. And, you know, one rain would have put me in the same boat as as everybody else. And I would have had my soil covered good for the, the warm months. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a delicate balance. And sometimes you learn things the hard way. But, I, sure. you know, I, it's... Uh, and I feel like as as you keep doing it, your soil just gets better and better and better. 
and you have more options to I, I try to compare it to like a, a flower pot you know when you first start trying to change your soil it's like you're trying to grow something in this teeny dixie cup and you know you you can't put a gallon of water in a teeny dixie cup but you know as you start growing your soil and making it have more water holding capacity you know all of a sudden you got this mm. big giant flower pot and then all of a sudden you know you get a gallon of water you get your flower pot that big flower pot can hold on to that for a lot longer than uh, a dixie cup and it allows you to to do different things so yeah um that's kind of my thinking along those lines. Yeah, that's really well said. And, you know, several things you've already mentioned, even starting with the, like the rainfall simulator and then you being out with that other guy, kind of just noticing the differences of here versus across the road or across the different field. Just a lot of those tangible things that you can notice with, you know, senses of seeing, feeling, smelling and stuff like that. I was going to ask kind of, you can see those things, they look different. Um, then how does that play into, you know, benefits, um, you know, financially and things like that. But I mean, that's pretty easy to relate with water holding capacity, infiltration rate. Um, but what other benefits are you seeing? Not just kind of like, as you increase the soil health, how does that kind of change your operation and benefit? Um, as for, I guess one of the biggest financial benefits would be the uh, reduction in fertilizer. I, I still use fertilizer but and um generally i'm taking a haney test or a plfa plfa test to see what microbial activity i have going on and you know been able to to cut that back significantly especially the last four years i would say you know there was a period that transition period when you're in there or, you know you know, I was under the impression that cover crops were like magic and fairy dust. And I would, when I first started and I just, I just plant these and I'll be the best farmer in the world and I can cut fertilizer immediately and won't know anything. So there was, you know, there was like six, eight years there were kind of hard because you didn't exactly, especially out here, it takes a little bit longer to transition your soil. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you're eight, nine, 10, you start seeing some of these soil tests and they're, you know, super low in the inorganic form of nitrogen, but you got, you know, 50, 60, 80 pounds out there that can be obtained from the soil. And, you know, I use uh, John Kemp's method when he, whenever I'm uh, putting on fertilizer. Um, so that helps me cut it back too, where I tie it with ammonium thiosis and some of his rejuvenating, some of his molybdenum. So, you know, whatever. I still have an agronomist. He kind of recommends what he thinks I need or what the industry standard is. And then I pretty much just take 40% off and do uh, John Kemp's program. And so, um, you know, I'm not always shooting for the highest yield um, on my farm. I'm kind, kind of going for the, you know, highest return on my, my dollar. So it doesn't always... I, I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, I'm not always chasing higher yields. I'm kind of watching finances and just trying to get the, you know, the optimum amount of return for that dollar invested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Keith kind of mentioned it last week in a conversation with Scott Scheimer, but just kind of, and you mentioned it too, the rye just kind of being a scary word sometimes in wheat production country. Um, but he mentioned last week just kind of that's it's not the rye that you're using the cereal rye for crop and cover crops aren't um the feral it's very good quality seed it's kind of a whole different animal um and so yeah and then especially speaking to the quality of seed i don't know if you want to use that as a segue talking about um your cleaning operation or even just kind of what led you to decide to get into some of the cleaning and um, kind of what that looks like for you um yep um so yeah i mean with a, along the line of the rye you know i i got fields that been out of rye for two years and i could go back to wheat in those fields and i would have less volunteer rye than you know the guys that have been trying to kill it for a number of years yeah it's, it's just a totally different animal it's very high germ and you know comes up and volunteers and it's very easy to 
uh, kill as long as you know you have a decent rotation in there to kill it off in the in the springtime for at least you know for two years and you know I've I've had good luck and it doesn't spread to the neighbors or anything like the the feral rye does so yeah they I might get a hard time or people look at it and they think it's the same as a feral rye but yeah it's 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 totally different and that, that's hard to explain sometimes I guess but um I had a my dad had a clipper 27 it's like a 30 bushel an hour machine and I had this friend that was he was cleaning yellow peas because he wanted to save some money so he was trying to clean he was cleaning his yellow peas with his little cleaner so he'd have enough yellow peas to plant and I went over there one day I just happened to be there and I was like you're using that thing I was like yeah it takes us a long time but mm -hmm. I, oh man so I, I got dads out of the shed and I, I at that time I had a bunch of rye for you guys and I was like why would you price this clean I, oh man so I I got that cleaner set up and I I think it took it took me 32 hours uh semi load. I was cleaning right out of the bin. <laughs> and so I I clean I think I cleaned like six loads that year. And then I had been watching the auctions and I found a real old clipper that needed a bunch of work that was in Illinois. So I, I picked that machine up. Um I I work on old cars. I used to work in restoration shops for a number of years, so I'm real good at fixing things and doing whatever building whatever um so i got this old cleaner and during the winter months i fixed it up it's like 100 it's a 200 bushel an hour machine so i was like holy cow man i'll be i'll be cleaning fast so right. then <laughs> then that you know that allowed me to price out you know have the rye shipped out of my facility or my farm already cleaned and everything and but when i upgraded machines you know it was manageable to be able to do a semi in six eight hours instead of you know four days so it made life a lot easier and then um that also opened up the door for growing different things together you know kind of a, along the lines of this regenerative thing you know seems like mother nature's never grown the same thing or one crop in an area so and even gardening you know there's a lot of stuff on companion plant and things that complement each other so um the hang up there was always be and finding somewhere to sell it if it was mixed together if you harvest it together or or what you could do with it so once i got that cleaner i was like oh man i can clean I can clean this out and sell these two products separate. So um, that uh, I just started trying rye and Austrian winter peas because um, they were a, a pretty easy separation. There was enough discrepancy there. And I, I found out that, you know, you can grow those together and the peas don't eat ding your rye yield any whatsoever. And you can, as long as you have the cleaner, you can harvest those and then separate out the peas and any any peas you get is a bonus um i think like the first year i did it you know you're not talking a, a bunch of peas you might depending how you plant it you got i mean you have to experiment with the planting rates and the way you plant it but you know even you know five bushels of peas at, the, at that year um, 300 pounds an acre you know you were looking at another 60 dollars an acre in revenue just by planting the peas with there and having the cleaner to be able to to clean them out so that kind of there's been numerous things i've tried yellow peas and vetch and hairy vetch and rye um i tried millet and buckwheat but that was the year that it um uh, chippies and flax is an easy one as far as separation so it kind of opens the door to be able to try all sorts of different things and you know, grow plants together that you know are companion plants and and might help each other and yield better than had you just planted them in in the monoculture. It's but um, like oats and peas is another one. Um, I kind of got away from peas because of the low residue after harvest, and I was always worried about catching snow in the winter. But you throw oats in there, you got a high carbon crop, and you got some stubble and it, the peas don't eat away all your residue so it's you know it's been fun to try different things and 
you know, along those lines, there's things I've tried that I shouldn't have tried that were really, really hard for me to clean out, or I couldn't even get them cleaned out. Um, woolly pod vetch and oats, I believe was the one I did. Grew mm -hmm. super, super good together. It was easy to combine, but then it was almost impossible to separate with the equipment that I had at that time because of the the width of the woolly pod vetch is identical to the width of the oats and that screen machine wouldn't get it out. So, you know, the, I guess my words of caution, if you start or people have asked me, I do things that are easy or way different seat sizes that are easy to separate and progress from there. Yeah, like, uh, I think Jonathan, there. there's some pictures of the rye and hairy vetch grown together. They'd be the photos of that purple or no, that's rye and uh, uh, Austrian peas. Hmm. So yeah, this this would have been the year of the rye and the Austrian peas. And I have a, a John Deere air seeder who I'm seven and a half inch spacing. So uh, that year they were just uh, planted down the same row, um, same spacing. And it's, you know, kind of interesting the uh, the peas go grow totally different in that environment because they're fighting for sunlight. And they're real, real super spindly, hardly any leaves on them, just climbing up the rye. And, you know, but they're and the pods are up way high, you know, up there with the head of the rye or maybe 12 inches down or so. And, you know, there might be three or four on a plant and they're smaller pods, you know, three, four peas a pod. Um, just totally changed how they grow. But, um, as far as harvesting them, you know, I can harvest that with the shellborn. You, I just run it a touch lower than I would normally to make sure I grab those peas, but they kind of matured at the same time and just enough seed difference that you know, I can clean those out um, very easily. It's it's one more stage. I, you know, I can clean the rye and the peas come off. And then once I'm done with rye, then I got to go back through and clean the peas again but you know what the rye is cleaned in one process still i just added another process for having to rerun the peas but um i've you know, grown peas monoculture and it's it's much easier to harvest them in uh in the polyculture than it is monoculture and plus i still have hmm. have the residue out there yeah so i mean sounds like some trial and error kind of com combining these and doing some companions but would you would you recommend kind of somebody who's interested in getting into this to just go ahead and and go for it? You know, finding the right combo and sure there's some tweaking of rates depending on the situation and stuff. But or would you say, ah, oh, just start maybe doing some rye at first, or would you, just, you know, say go ahead and throw some peas or vetch in there? Uh, you know, I I feel like there's an if you do your research, there's enough literature out there, um, and there's enough things out there of people doing the polycultures and you know things that are known to work you know start with those and you know progress to ones after you get it if you have the cleaner and you figure out how to clean these things out progress to different ones and yeah there's always tweaking with the the rates or or figuring it out but um i kind of just you know tailor my polyculture polycultures to still you know um focus I'm still kind of putting my focus towards one main crop. And if I get a bonus crop that I know I can clean out, then, you know, that's kind of some additional revenue or some additional things that would help out too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a few questions. I know we have a couple of questions that popped up. John, do you want to kind of move to some Q&A or is there anything else on the operation you wanted to share about specifically? Um, no, if you want to go to those Ryan Vetch ones, Jonathan, I think they're the next two photos. I get that. Yeah, that's just that'd be a cover crop mix that I planted on my farm. So, uh, and there's some. Oh, you the know, uh, last one was a buckwheat, but here's some uh, hairy vetch. There we go. Yep, there's a hairy vetch and rye grown together, and I did that last year. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, uh, you know, was that was the field that I drove by the most and checked the most, just because it was you know, so cool instead, you know, see all that 
and last year was a wet year out here so it started flowering in mid-may and i it flowered through july um i didn't end up finishing combine in that field well into august which was later than normal but it was just fun to watch that field grow um, with the ryan veg planted together in that particular field i did i did half the field was rye and vetch planted in the same row and the other half of the field was rye and vetch on alternating rows um, i'm able to switch my air seeder with a couple levers to the front and back ranks and pull out a different tank so um i was just trying to see if it yielded better if the vetch was in its own row and had 15 inch of space between plants but you know by the time things were said and done it didn't really matter how i did it it's been all that works splitting the rows and planting them together they just structures and the way the plants grew was different but at the end of the day it was all about the the same yield so well, it's like you know, like, the out there you know how, yeah, how much vetch is the hard parts getting it in the combine i mean that didn't uh popping out or that yeah. field i had to end up desiccating um which i don't really like doing it was my only downside of that uh crop because i couldn't get the i couldn't not slug my combine i tried but <laughs> yeah yeah what was the planting rate on the vetch there in this field um i did 12 pounds of vetch with uh 56 pounds of rye okay yeah so i cut the i cut the rye back like 30 pounds from what i'd normally do and then um yeah, so, yeah. Uh, that's good. Um, and that that field got hailed real bad, but the the vetch actually where the rose where the vetch was intertwined with the rye, it like, helped hold it up so the heads didn't get totally demolished. So I I was still able to harvest that whole field even though it was severely hailed so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's good um and then just kind of thinking overall with what you shared so far and you know getting started and where you're going next i'll ask this question that that kate asked in the q a uh so i'll just read it here what research did john do early on before starting cover cropping to convince him to start using them on all of his acres instead of just starting small and then how did he figure it out which cover crops to use um, we'll start there and then kind of go to. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, the no till on the plains was, um, the year I was there, they had all those DVDs from like the previous year so that you could get like five years of conferences on these DVDs. So I bought every DVD I had and I watched all the speakers and stuff and Gabe Brown and some of the farmers and, you know, realized all these, there's, there's always somebody with less rainfall that's doing something, that you say you can't do here so you know i found those guys or talked to those farmers that were already doing it and that kind of opened up my eyes to it um when i first started doing like the mixes with cover crops i didn't didn't exactly know what to plan or what to do so i at that time i worked with keith um designing those mixes and then you know as you get into it you learn things um not to do or cover crop you know depending what your next crop is you know things that you don't want to put into uh, um, a mix that might go into your your next year's crop like i one year i had a bunch of buckwheat in a cover crop mix and i was going to yellow field peas the next year well it was all fine and dandy but then all the volunteer buckwheat came up so then i got you know then i that was out of options there so i just had a bunch of buckwheat in my I love buckwheat, but, you know, sometimes if you're going to that crop that's a broadleaf and a broadleaf, you can't take it out. So, you know, there's always those those problems. But, I, you know, if any of those conferences or any of those resources, I think, are a good resource. And that's where I gain my knowledge from. Yeah, no, that's great. Um any uh, <clears throat> livestock on the operation or any experiences there with livestock? Um, let's see. Yeah, tw 2016 um, would have been the year that I I just planted cover crops, like full, didn't plant a cash crop, planted full season, 15, 20 species mixes. 
um, for grazing some stalker stalker calves. Um, so I did that for a year. Um, so I, I haven't got, I started getting into that and then the seed cleaning thing kind of started going. So I had to change directions. I just ran out of resources and you know, I, I really like doing that full season cover crop and using that as a cash crop because mm -hmm. expense wise, I was just looking at, you know, a, the seed for the cover crop and maybe a burn down and a little bit of fertilizer and and i was done so that was you know i liked that part of it and just i think the, and we were we were moving them every day um setting up temporary fencing and moving them every day and coming back through mm -hmm. um, but at this point in time i just i don't have the resources to clean seed and and run the cows at, at this point in time but yeah yeah no, oh, that's, uh, I think that's understandable. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the next steps to continuing to improve or kind of continue to build on your operation? Um, I would say just trying to um, get away from as much uh, fertilizer and herbicide as I can um, and trying to grow more of the poly crops and figuring out things that um, that I can grow together that are complementary and uh, profitable i guess just a you know the overall goal is you know trying to get some of the microbial numbers up on my plfa to a certain threshold that you know i can feel comfortable just um, not applying anything out there and just living with what i got out there um, you just kind of watch those numbers on those tests you know kindly have steadily increased but just still not quite there yet on being able to wean myself off everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Sounds good. Uh, there's another question here. Do you graft the seed when you sow it? And if you do, what are you using additional minerals to, to the growing plants and just kind of what fertilizer are you using? How much, if you want to share any, any of that info? Um, I, I've done a number of things with seed. I, I guess I've made some of my own compost and use some vermiculture stuff. I experiment experimented with a number of those uh, seed treatments. Um, I can't say that I necessarily saw anything light and day difference. Um, I didn't see anything detrimental. Um, just as you know, I progressed with. You know, it takes a fair amount of time to make those seed inoculants yourself um, and do some of that. So as my time's been limited and my family's grown, I've I've kind of not have done as much of that as I would like to have liked to or be doing. Um, and then, as you know, I am running some uh, dry fertilizer mixed with some humic when I am planting my seeds. And any any time I put fertilizer on, I try to you know, follow John Kemp's guidelines and mix it with a humic or a carbon source to try and limit the damage that I'm doing to my soil. Mm -hmm. well, that's good. Sounds good. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So if anybody wants to pop those in the, the Q&A chat there or the Q&A box. Uh, John, I was going to ask, just is there a certain that sticks out to you in your soil health journey or just farming journey that like a mentality or mindset, especially for you, you know, like just overcoming fear of failure or just not being afraid to try things or what's something for you that, you know, it's been really kind of, as you reflect on a journey, that's kind of been sticking out to you. I would say probably just, um, focusing on the end goal of what I want my soil change to look like. Um, you know, having us changing that soil and doing whatever you can, I decide, I always have that end, you know, how's this going to, how's this decision going to affect my, you know, final goal of improving my soil health and improving the bottom line and everything about my soil on my farm. So I guess by having, you know, that overall goal, it kind of helps shape some of your intermittent management decisions of, is this a 
detrimental thing or is this going to be a beneficial thing to for the outcome that I'm looking to see? Yeah, I think that's really well said because, I mean, even in green cover here, there's so many decisions to be made each day and going towards just either our core values, our end goal, our mission statement, kind of our vision that helps bring clarity right. to any of those questions that would come along. That's that's really well said. Yeah. Um, okay, Matt asks, what do we need to focus on um, differently, kind of speaking of fertility, um, growing for seed versus growing for grain? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't really um, treat them differently um as growing for seed as growing for um grain i still kind of have the the same approach towards those but um i feel like you know as i my soils it helped me with the seed quality of because as as i improve that soil um you know like for example uh like last year there was a fair amount of cesarium in our area um especially with the weeds and stuff and where i've been farming different for a number of years you know like some of that scout we sent you i sent green cover and some of that turkey red um you know, i heard there's reports of like 60 percent germ on some of the new varieties of weed out here well you know that turkey and that scout came back at like 98 percent germs so i feel like you know as if you can focus on changing that soil and stuff you know your plants are gonna reward you um, for growing in a more happy conditions i think yeah yeah oh, that's good um mike mike mcdonald asked john what are your plans on carbon payments through your cover crop and diverse rotations um I haven't looked at any of that or um, I've heard about it, but I haven't looked at any of it or anything. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm unsure of that. I just kind of stick my nose to the ground and keep, uh, keep doing what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's understandable. I think that's something that, you know, is good for people to look into if they think that would be beneficial for their operation and, Totally understand, right. again, you know, if that's kind of not what you're looking to do at the time. So, yeah, like when I some of the equip programs and stuff um, early on that I, I tried to get into, they, you know, they're any of those programs are kind of, I feel like they're restrictive and they have their own guidelines and things that, you know, they want to have a little bit of say in what you can and can't do. And that's, I, I didn't like that. Um, I wanted to have, the decision solely on me and mm -hmm. um, solely what I wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, we talked about kind of viewing similar grown for seed or grain, but you know, for your cover crop mixes, differentiating them from growing for seed, um, just kind of any management things there, are you a little bit more hands off as far as, um, fertilizers and things like that when it's a cover crop mix, you know, maybe in the summer after a, a grain harvest. Yeah. On the, um, the only thing I ever fertilized was the full season stuff for, uh, forage. Um, but usually, um, if I'm, if it's after a harvest or something, I, I don't go out there. It's, um, any fertilizer. I kind of just, you know, let the plants do what they're going to do and, you know, they help keep my, just by having them out there, they help keep my weeds away. Um, and for me, you know, that's enough. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, they, they have helped me uh, not use so much herbicide. Yeah. I usually have to use herbicide to kill them, but during that fallow period where I'd normally or would have to be killing weeds or doing something, I, you know, I can, avoid that herbicide use just by having something living out there that I wanted. Yeah, uh, that's good. Um, I'm going to kind of close with this. I don't you have any closing thoughts, but I was just going to ask, you know, what's one thing that you wish, or if you could, you know, you would have 
almost every farmer in America, you know, do on their operation, whether that's just experiment with this or that, or kind of think through things this way or that way, what's kind of one thing you could spur on to, you know, the farming community at large. I think if they could just go out to a farmer or somebody in their area that's been using these practices and take a shovel to that soil and have a sample of their own soil and just see what the difference is in that soil and you know under, understand that they're we've done things because that's the way we've done them but there is there is a change or there is a, you know, a better way to do some things. And I, th I think if, we, if if you've seen two soils in a fence row with the only difference is management practices, I, I think that would open up a, like seen, seen as believing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I kind of opened up um, with the webinar just talking about like connections and stuff, but um, you know, people connections being connected to you or I mean, Scott Ravencamp, that can be a, a big game changer, but also just connected back to the soils, not being hands off, but, you know, being literal, literal boots on the ground and, you know, kind of yeah. seeing, smelling, feeling. That's really good. Um, well, that's all the questions we have, John. Is there any closing right. or comments you want to make? No, th thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you so much for joining. Yep. Um, Jonathan, anything to, else to close? Nope, I think we're good. Thanks, everybody. Okay, that sounds great. Appreciate it, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. All right, you too. Thanks, John. Yep.